everyone, it's Sarah with RegisterNurseRN.com and in this video I'm going to be going over hypoparathyroidism versus hyperparathyroidism. Now in the previous videos I went in great detail regarding the patho, the causes, the signs and symptoms about these two conditions individually. So if you haven't watched those videos I highly recommend watching those and a card should be popping up so you can access that playlist. Now after you watch this video be sure to go to my website registerednursern.com and take the free quiz that will test your knowledge on hyper versus hyper parathyroidism. So what I want this video to be is a quick review just so you can refer to it if you're fixing to take your NCLEX or a nursing lecture exam so you can see what the differences are between these two conditions. So let's get started. Okay first let's talk about hypoparathyroidism. What is it? It is a low secretion of PTH parathyroid hormone by the parathyroid gland. What is hyperparathyroidism? It is a high secretion of PTH, parathyroid hormone, by the parathyroid gland. So pretty much they're the opposite of each other. What's going on? In hypoparathyroidism, you're going to have hypocalcemia, a low calcium level, and a high phosphate level, hyperphosphatemia. On the flip side, in hyperparathyroidism, you're going to have a high calcium level and a low phosphate level. So let's look at the causes. What causes hypoparathyroidism? One cause is there's damage or manipulation to like the thyroid gland or the parathyroid gland. And the reason is, is because these two glands set close to each other, they share the same blood supply. So for instance, if the patient went and had a thyroidectomy, they're at risk for experiencing hypoparathyroidism. So you'd wanna watch their calcium levels. Another cause is a low magnesium level, hypomagnesiemia. The reason is, is because the magnesium plays a role in how the parathyroid works. And if you don't have enough magnesium, parathyroid isn't going to work well and it's not going to release PTH. Another thing, autoimmune, the body attacks it, um, releases antibodies, attacks the gland, it doesn't work, or the body is resistant to PTH. Remember we talked about in the patho that PTH stimulates your kidneys and your bones to work to release that calcium. But here, um, it's not working. The parathyroid's releasing the hormone just fine, but the kidneys and the bones don't care. Now let's look at the causes on hyperparathyroidism. This is divided into a primary cause and a secondary cause. The primary cause is um, there's something wrong with the gland itself. And usually what happens, you have hyperplasia, which is enlargement of one of those four glands. You have a, a tumor like an ad adenoma or a cancer. Secondary cause, it's not the thyroid gland, but it's a disease causing the thyroid gland to mess up which um, chronic renal failure can do this because your kidneys just aren't working appropriately and um, that's gonna mess up your calcium levels and then your parathyroid's gonna be overworked. So you're gonna experience hyperparathyroidism. Also hypocalcemia can cause that again because your parathyroid is stimulated by calcium levels. So you, if you have extensive hypocalcemia, you can flip yourself into this condition and vitamin D deficiency. So how does the patient look? What are those big signs and symptoms that you need to know that will help you distinguish between hypo and hyperparathyroidism? Okay, signs and symptoms. Um, for hypoparathyroidism, I like to remember the mnemonic PTH for parathyroid hormone. Okay, P, paresthesia. This is like that tingling, numbness on the lips, uh, the fingers, the toes. Uh, they may have a positive trousseau sign or Chabot stick sign. Tetany, where you're having involuntary muscle contraction or cramping, um, definitely puts their air, airway at risk because they can have bronchospasms. Uh, also, their labs are going to have be hypocalcemic and hyperphosphatemic. So you want to look at those. How are you going to look in hyperparathyroidism? The patient is going to have bone fractures because those bones are just leaking out that calcium because all that ex excessive PTH stimulating those bones to break down those osteoclasts, which performs bone resorption, which leaks calcium into the blood. So the bones are going to become weak and break. Constipation. GI system is slowing down smooth muscle because calcium plays a role in muscle contraction. So it's going to slow down. You're going to have constipation. Renal calculi. Again, just that extensive amount of calcium and how your kidneys play a role in absorbing that. So stone formation. 
nausea and vomiting, epigastric pain, high calcium levels, increase your gastrin acid, which will cause epigastric pain, the nausea and the vomiting, and excessive urination. Again, it's causing the kidneys to overwork themselves because of the high calcium. Now let's look at nursing interventions. What are we gonna do for this patient as a nurse? What's the big things we need to know, which includes medications, what the physician will order. Okay, as a nurse with hypoparathyroidism, we are going to monitor the vital signs, the airway, especially because of the tetany going on. Labs, administer medications as ordered by the physician. And the goal of the medications is to increase the calcium levels because we have hypocalcemia and to decrease those false levels. So how does that work? Okay, if the calcium level is severe enough, they may order IV calcium like calcium gluconate. One thing you want to remember about this is if the patient's on ditch, it can increase digoxin toxicity. So remember that. Another thing is PO, oral calcium medications with vitamin D. Why with vitamin D? Because vitamin D helps absorb calcium. And the side effect of this could be GI upset, constipation, and increased chances of renal stones. Another medication is phosphate binders. Because remember, in this condition, we have hyperphosphatemia. So just as the name says, it's going to be phosphate binders. And how do, how do these work? Um, one drug is called aluminum carbonate. It's really neat. And what it does is it takes the phos that you're eating and the food and puts it in your stool and you excrete it out. And um, so you would want to administer this medication with food. And last but not least, parathyroid hormone replacement. These patients are deficient on PTH, so you can give it to them. Uh, medication is called NAPARA. It's an injection, however you wanna monitor the calcium levels with this for any GI upset or paresthesia. Okay, so what are the nursing interventions for hyperparathyroidism? Nursing interventions would include to monitor the vital signs, strain the urine for any kidney stones, assess the patient if they may be having to pass a kidney stone like that excruciating flank pain. Encourage fluids as tolerated. However, watch this in your patients with congestive heart failure or renal failure because they can't tolerate lots of fluids. Um, however, it will prevent dehydration and the chances of a renal stone forming. One treatment includes surgical treatment would be a parathyroidectomy. And this is usually treatment for the main cause of the primary kind, like enlargement of one of those glands, an adenoma or a cancerous tumor, and they would go in and remove the gland that's affected. So you'd wanna prep the patient for that. And in the previous videos, we talked in depth about that. Another thing, physicians may order medications, and as the nurse, you will administer those. And the goal of the medications is to decrease calcium levels, decrease parathyroid uh, hormone levels, and to keep the patient hydrated. So some medication treatments would include IV solution therapy, like normal saline, that's just for hydration. Um, medications called calcimimetics, also known as Sensipar, and this is usually a treatment for patients who are experiencing secondary cause with chronic renal failure. And what this medication does is it goes in and it mimics the role of calcium, which tricks the parathyroid into thinking those calcium levels are great. So it quits releasing so much PTH. So it brings down your calcium levels and your parathyroid hormone levels. Another medication, calcitonin, and it works by decreasing the calcium levels and protecting the bones. Another drug, loop diuretics like Lasix. What this does is it decreases the calcium levels by inhibiting calcium reabsorption in those renal tubules. Also with Lasix, of course, watch your potassium because it wastes potassium. And last but not least, biphosphates also some popular ones are Aredia or Fosamax, and what these biphosphates do is they slow down osteoclast activity, which breaks down the bones and increases osteoblast activity, which builds up the bones. So you're gonna build the bones up and protect them. However, one thing you want to remember if you are giving a patient Fosamax is that they take it all by, those, by itself, um, on an empty stomach, no food, with a full glass of water and that they set up for at least 30 minutes after taking it because this medication is very hard on the stomach and the esophagus and it can cause ulcers. Okay, so that is hyper 
parathyroidism versus hypoparathyroidism. Now go to my website, registernursorian.com and take that free quiz that will test your knowledge on these two conditions. And be sure to check out my other NCLEX endocrine reviews. And thank you so much for watching. And please consider subscribing to this YouTube channel.